I mentioned in an earlier video today that I was going to sing Beneath the Cross of Jesus. Now, this book that I usually sing from, where I tell the hymn history, it's not in it. And also the iPod, from which I gather some, some of those hymn histories, it's not in the Schaefer family site that I've been more recently reading hymn histories from. I know I did it, though, at one point, so it must have been on the other site that I used to gather hymn stories from, but I couldn't, I couldn't pull that together. So what I'm saying here is if you'd like to hear Beneath the Cross of Jesus, search my other videos here on YouTube. Now, there was a time where I didn't do the videos, or I mean, I didn't do these singing videos on YouTube. I started doing them on Livestream.com and a channel there called Family Bible Time. So if you can't find it here on YouTube's Family Bible Time channel, by just doing a search for it, go over to Livestream.com, type in Family Bible Time in the search, and there I'm not sure how to direct you to find it, because I never gave it the title. I always call them Songs for the Day. Song for the Day. So you can search it out there and you might find it. So I know this is one I've also sang. It's one that I sang, and I know it was on live stream when I first sang it. And I remember very clearly the first time, well, I sang this song for live stream. And the situation with my mother, and how, I, oh, it almost choked me up so much when I, when I, when the Lord brought, directed me to this. But nonetheless, the Lord has done that again here today. So I hope I can get through this. So my mom is near the point of death. This is one of her favorite songs. As it is many. Favorite hymns have been written by evangelists and preachers, great pillars of the church and revolutionaries, but this is probably the only well-known hymn written by a pharmacist. C. Austin Miles was born in New Jersey in January of 1868. He attended the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy and graduated from the University of Pennsylvania. He then obtained a, pos a position as pharmacist and worked in that field for several years. And during that time, he wrote his first gospel song. When it received a degree of popularity, Miles decided gospel music was more rewarding than pharmacy and left his profession, profession for a career in publishing. If I can interject... <laughs> A lot of times that's how we lose Christian service. For folks that start off in Christian service then find something else is more rewarding, so they bail and go to to the other thing. It's happened here locally. We used to have Christian radio station. The family that owned that Christian radio station had also started tinkering with the field of undertaking. And they determined that undertaking was more profitable than the Christian radio station, so they let it slide. The Christian radio station sold it to other folks who, you know, made it so it wasn't a Christian station anymore. But anyways, this one had the opposite effect. I'm not going to judge whether or not it meant more profitable monetarily, or if it was more profitable spiritually. We'll just go with that. I mean, we see what came of it. It was all good anyway. Um, in 1898, at the age of 30, he took a full-time position with the Hall Mac Publishing Company in Philadelphia, where he was to serve as editor and manager for the next four decades. It was during this period that music publisher Dr. Adam Giebel approached Miles with a suggestion that he write a hymn text that would be in a sympathetic in tone, breathing tenderness in every line, one that would bring hope to the hopeless, rest for the weary, and downy pillows to dying beds. I'm going to skip the next paragraph because it tells the title of the song. And I'm going to leave that to be a, a surprise for you. But it was after Geibel's suggestion that the unusual circumstances came about in this hymn. And Miles himself recounts the occasion in George W. Stanville's book, Forty Gospel Hymn Stories, and this is an excerpt from that. One day in March 1912, in the dark room where I kept my photographic equipment and organ, I drew my Bible toward me and opened at the favorite chapter of John 20. Whether by chance or inspiration, 
bloody traitor to side. That meeting of Jesus and Mary had lost none of its power to charm. As I read it that day, it seemed to be part of the scene, or I seemed to be part of the scene. I became a silent witness to that dramatic moment in Mary's life when she knelt before her Lord and cried, Rabboni. My hands were resting on the Bible while I stared at the light blue wall. Miles continues to describe how, in a vivid vision, the scene of Mary Magdalene coming to the empty tomb at daybreak was enacted before him on the wall of his dark room. He recalls witnessing Mary's initial despair and then her joy as she recognizes the gardener as her Lord, the risen Christ. He continues, I awakened in full light, gripping the Bible, with muscles tense and nerves vibrating. Under the inspiration of the vision, I wrote as quickly as the words could be formed the poem exactly as it has since appeared. That same evening, I wrote the music. The first two verses of the hymn detail the scene through Mary's eyes as she comes to the garden while the dew is still on the roses. Now you know what song it is. And how she rejoices to recognize the voices belonging to the Son of God. In the third verse, she relates the, the command of her Savior to go and tell of her experience. Some students of religious music have criticized Miles' hymn as being a sentimental song about the joys of a garden at daybreak. But the experience of the author and the close, close connection with the scripture passage in John 20 support the fact that it is indeed an inspired message of hope and encouragement. Its popularity as a gospel favorite is second only to the old rugged cross, and it speaks well of its ability to touch the lives of those who sing it in churches everywhere. C. Austin Miles wrote additional religious anthems and cantatas in the years prior to his death in 1946, but he was said to have felt his gospel hymns had made the greatest contribution, but th that his gospel hymns had made the greatest contribu contribution to the average person. Certainly, the thousands who have been blessed by the beautiful verses of in the garden would be among the first to agree. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear falling on my ear the Son of God discloses, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there. None other has ever known. He speaks, and the sound of his voice is so sweet, the birds hush their singing. And the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing, and he walks with me, and he talks with me. And he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever I'd stay 
in the garden with him. Though the night around me be falling, but he bids me go through the voice of woe, his voice to me is calling, and he walks with me, and he talks with me. And he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever 